Yo, what up? So I know there are tons of exposure triangle videos out there, but hear me out for one second. Too many of them assume that you have some form of base knowledge and they're not the best for beginners. So this is going to be a beginner's guide to the exposure triangle. An exposure triangle for dummies, if you will. So we're going to talk about what the exposure triangle is, how it affects the light and brightness of your image. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how it affects the overall look of your image, like your focus. Also, we're going to talk about how it affects your photos versus your videos, because those two things are a little bit different. Let's get into it. But first and foremost, welcome to Creative Tech Lab. My name is Leo. This is probably your first time here. Thank you for clicking on this video that makes you an awesome person. And to the 4,600 people that have decided to go down below and hit up the subscribe button, I'm always humbled that you decided to do that. So I just like to give a shout out at the start of every single video for the people that have done that. I am greatly appreciative. All right, so the exposure triangle. Now, to dumb this down as much as possible and get it into the beginner's terms, we're going to be using an analogy. Today, we're going to be using the analogy of the eye. I'm going to assume that since you're on YouTube, you're familiar with eyes. However, if you're in the medical industry or you're just really good at human anatomy, this is not going to be a medical description of the eye. However, for the purposes of today's video, it will make sense. Just trust me and stick around until the end. So overall, the exposure triangle are the three mechanisms that control the amount of light that's getting into your lens and sensor and overall making the brightness of your image. Those three things are going to be your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. Three things, hence the exposure triangle, and you have to balance out all three of those things in order for your image to be exposed properly. If one of those things are off, your image will either be over or underexposed and it won't look right. Now mapping that out to our eye analogy, your aperture is going to be like your pupil, your shutter speed is going to be like your eyelid, and your eye is so... Uh, well that's going to be like a magic potion that could make your eyes either more or less sensitive to light. Again, follow along, it will make sense. Alright, so sticking with our eye analogy, let's jump into the aperture. Your aperture is like your pupil, the round part of your eye, because it controls how bright something is by how small or how wide it is open. Just like your pupil, when it's dilated, meaning it's wide open, more light's coming in and when it constricts, less light is coming in, making your image darker. Now, aperture is expressed in f-stop, so you routinely hear stuff like f1.4, f4, f8, so on and so forth. Some people get a little confused because the smaller seeming the number, the bigger the opening is. However, your aperture is expressed as a fraction, so when you hear f2, that's f over 2. I'm not going to go too far down those mechanisms, however, just know that like with fractions, i.e. math, when the denominator, the bottom number, is bigger, the overall fraction, the overall value is smaller. So just like a sixteenth of something is smaller than an eighth of something and an eighth of something is smaller than a fourth of something and so on and so forth. The same thing with your aperture. The opening for f8 is going to be smaller than f4, f4 smaller than f2, hence the smaller opening making things darker. And as you can see here on this big old 85 mil with this opening here, as I stop it down from f1.8 to f22, you could see see the aperture blades closing up and making the circle that lets the light in smaller there. Alright, so now let's get into the shutter aka our eyelid. On a traditional camera, your shutter is a curtain that closes to capture your image. So imagine that you're able to take a picture with your brain and every time your eyelid was to close, you will actually be able to take a picture. This is how shutter works. Now, the longer it takes for your eyelid to close before you capture that picture, the more light that would be coming in. And then if you were to blink really fast, that's the less light that would come in there. So it would make the image a lot darker. Now, allow me to look a little bit stupid for the purposes of this video, but if I blink really fast, you can see things getting darker in front of you. Whereas if I leave my eyes open, all the light around me is now coming into my my eyes and things are getting brighter. This is kind of how shutter works. Shutter is also expressed as a fraction, but this time we're talking about a fraction of time. And that's why, again, the bigger the bottom number, the smaller the actual time is making it faster there. So when we're talking about things like one thousandth of a second, that's a really fast shutter. That means things are closing really fast, not letting much light into the lens. Whereas one fiftieth of a second, there'll be more time, more light coming into the lens, making things brighter. That's also 
why when you hear people talk about long exposure photography, they're actually talking about long exposure in terms of long amount of times. And that's when you start to get into actual whole numbers. So you have a shutter of one second, two seconds, all the way up to like 30 seconds when you're really trying to get something really dark like the stars or something. But that's what long exposure photography means there. It's usually referring to the shutter. And then lastly, our ISO, AKA our magic light sensitivity potion. So imagine if the doctor was to put eye drops into your eye that would make your light more or less sensitive to light. During the daytime, that might be kind of annoying. You would have to squint, i.e. in this case, you'd be closing your pupils or your shutter, AKA your eyelids, in order to make the image darker so you could see. But at nighttime, this would be very beneficial because you'd probably be able to see things that you wouldn't be able to see at night. ISO works in the same way. You're artificially boosting the sensitivity of the sensor to light in order to boost the signal of the image there after you have your shutter speed and your aperture set the way that you want it there. It gives you a little bit of extra your oomph there. All right, so now that we understand the three different mechanisms on how to control how bright our image is, the main question that comes into play there is which one do you need to adjust in order to get the right look for your photos or your video? And the reason being is that all three will affect the look of your image a little bit differently, mainly your focus. So let's start with another oversimplification again. When it is that we talk about how aperture makes your image look we always want to talk about how things look from this plane from back to front. So if I hold my hand up here and hold my other hand up here and my face is back here, as you could see, this lens is at f1.4. So everything is getting um, progressively more out of focus there. My first hand is in um, focus. Um, aperture works on this plane here, which is why people refer to depth of feel when they're talking about aperture. It's really what we want to talk about from back to front. And then our other oversimplification there, your shutter is going to deal with how things move on your X and your Y plane there. That's why people refer to it as movement. So getting into some examples here, when I say aperture here, I have my two kids here. I have Ari in front. I have Zane in the back there. We're shooting at f1.8 on this lens. And as you could see, Zane is standing behind him again on this plane from back to front and he's out of focus when we're shooting at f1.8 this gives most people the background separation and or the bokeh that many people covet however if it is that you were trying to take a group photo of both of them and they were not standing on the same plane then you would need to adjust your aperture now you see if i stop it down to f8 the image gets really dark but all both of them are in focus all i have to do is just adjust my shutter speed in order to let some more light into the image. But now I'm able to get a lot more of them in focus because I did change my aperture in order to get more of the things in focus. And again, aperture affects things from back to front there. Now let's move to our other planes again left to right and a little bit up and down there we're on this busy intersection here as these cars are passing by here and as you could see if i have my shutter set here to one over a thousand every time i snap a picture i could get the motion of the car because it's snapping it really fast there and the motion of the car is being affected there however if i move down to let's say one over 30 or one over 50 here as the cars pass by we see a lot Lot more blur and everything is not in focus that's the way shutter works shutter affects movement the same thing if something was jumping up and down or if a child was jumping or tumbling or whatever you'd want a faster shutter speed in order to be able to capture everything in crisp focus there and then lastly for our iso sometimes we might have the right aperture and the right shutter speed but things not be exposed correctly particularly at nighttime or when you're indoors you might not have enough light there. That's when you want to use your magic potion and you're going to boost the ISO in order to get the right exposure, get your image exposed correctly. The only problem is though, is that you have a limit to how far you could do this because ISO, because it's quote unquote fake light, eventually you start to introduce too much grain into your image and your footage will start to look grainy or unusable if that's not the look that you're going for. All right, so let's bring that all together and how that works, particularly for photos. So again, let's say that it is that you are shooting portraits. So if you're shooting kind of like I was shooting with my kids there, Ari and Zane, if you were just shooting one of them and you wanted to blow the background out, you now know that if you want to make your background blurry, you need to adjust your aperture. Once you adjusted your aperture though, and it's if your image is still over or underexposed, the next thing you have to do is adjust your shutter. And then if you need to, if you can't get it right with the shutter, then you jump 
to your ISO. Same thing there if you're taking a group family photo though and you had a bunch of people and you had a bunch of different things in your image that you wanted to keep in focus, you also know that you wanted to quote unquote stop down and use a smaller aperture, something like f4, f8, so you could get more things in focus. This is why I usually when people are shooting like landscapes or something or like when I shoot street photography, I shoot at f7 or f, uh, f7.1 or f8 or something like that just so I could get more things in focus and then I adjust my shutter speed to be something a minimum of let's say 1 over 150 or usually like even higher than that especially on a bright day or something in order to make sure that I'm also getting the movement there. Getting into movement there if it is that you're shooting something like sports let's say you're at a football game or your kid's soccer game or something like that then you want to prioritize your shutter speed first making sure that you shut your shutter and then you'd have to shut your aperture in order to let some more light in if you're using a really fast shutter something like 1 over 1000 things might get a little bit dark there depending on how bright it is outside but you have your aperture to set there and then lastly if it is that you're prioritizing one of these two things at nighttime then you always have to adjust to let enough light in and we know that we're going to use big apertures for that so f1.4 f8 and such and then we're going to use our iso to boost the image up now that's for photos for video things are a little bit different but now that we have an understanding of how shutter speed aperture and iso works for photos we can now apply that to video after all video is really just still pictures strung together to give you some motion there the major difference though is that in video we have our shutter speed set based on our frame rate so using the 180 degree rule that most people follow your shutter speed should be double your frame rate the reason for this again is to affect motion so when somebody says something like this is 24 frames per second there is 24 pictures being taken every second that we are recording this your shutter is still moving at a particular speed though and that's what gives you this particular motion blur here in front of my face and this is the motion blur that looks most natural to the human eye so if you actually focus on your hand like i'm putting it in front of my face here it should look about similar to my hand on the screen there as it's moving back and forth that's why you want to double your frame rate when it is that you're using your shutter speed there and then you can always adjust for your aperture if you want to get that look many people think that cinematic look is that super blown out background because a lot of high quality cameras look like that however when you're shooting something like an interview and the people aren't sitting on the exact same plane there you might want to use something like f4 or higher to make sure that you could keep them in focus especially if they move back and forth if you have a really shallow depth of field there and your autofocus isn't that great you don't want to get the autofocus hunting so in video sometimes you need to stop down as well and not make everything so shallow in the background there as well one more thing to note there especially for video during the daytime you might have your shutter set correctly and your aperture set to where you need it and things might be too still too bright the fourth thing that you can do is use filters but that's a video for another day if you want to see more about nd filters i actually have a video about a particular nd filter where i explain why you would need to use one for video so just link up here and link down below for that so if you're still here with me at this part in the video first of all you're awesome second of all that mean i may have made a little bit of sense or you just like to hear me talk either which way i really appreciate it hopefully that all makes sense timestamps will be down below if you need to go back and re-watch certain things with our eye analogy and then our how it affects our looks and what to adjust there but i needed to make this particular video in order to make the next video that's coming out which is talking about which modes or how to understand the different modes on your cameras particularly your sony cameras so if you are not subscribed hit the subscribe button and hit the notification button so you can know exactly when that video comes out and there will be a ton more stuff to come on run and gun videography and photography here on the channel not to mention some music stuff coming sound design all that good stuff so again thank you for rocking with me thank you for watching this long i greatly appreciate it and i will see you in the next video big up yourself peace